Hey everybody, what's up? I've got two of Dan Dryzen's latest reviews here. As you know, Dan Dryzen, who's a very legendary, I guess you could say, fan, one of the oldest fans uh, of the Sonic community, you know, the Sonic, Sonic Digital Comic Book by Archie Comics. Uh, basically, uh, Times reviews issues that take place months before. Now, this one he's reviewed is 235, which was released in uh, May, uh, a few months ago, back in May. So, and if you notice my eyes looking towards this way, it's because if I have to stop and redo this later tonight, it's because my mom will show up and I don't need her interrupting or anything. All right. Of course, you know, anybody that's got this comic, um, I've got this issue and has read it, pretty much knows who the artists are and who wrote it. All right. It's called Remember the Fall. And it goes by who the script is, Ian Flynn, Art, Tracy, Ink is Terry, Color Matt, Lettering John, Assistant Editor Vince, Editor Paul, Editor-in-Chief Victor, Apprentice Mortician, <laughs> Mike Perito, and the Sega licensing, the Sega licensing reps Anthony Gacko, Grotko, and Cindy Chow. Now this is basically what it says. Now first of all, for anybody that might be new to this, he goes basically by a point system. And from what I can average, it's a 30 point system. Head score, heart score, and art score. If you get a 30, basically 10 points each. If you get 10, that's a 30. That's you did. If they get it, if he scores at 10 each, excellent. If it's lower, well, it's just to say there's some work there. Okay, but here we go. And I quote Dan Dryzen's review of 235. Remember the Fallen? As we rejoin Extreme Makeover Onyx Island Edition. Silver has just discovered a hidden room behind the sliding bookcase. While that may be an agricultural cliché left over from every horror movie made in the 1930s, the hidden room turns out to be a library conveniently stocked with all kinds of material on the old freedom fighters. And he puts that in quotations, old freedom fighters. So, does Silva apply for a stipend and settle down for the next few years to assimilate all the newfound data? Nah, because that would sound too much like work. What, does, what he does instead is to snap up a copy of Antoine's journal. Okay. Diaries? In, okay. Hold on. Okay, seriously? Do people still write their names on the front of the diaries anymore? I can expect to see a person's name on a Facebook page because they want other people to read it, but the journal appears to Silver to be the answer to everything. Meanwhile, in the relatively present, Bunny's bringing Antoine and the readers up to speed. Rather than try, rather than try what worked for King Max back in the day, they got Ant hooked up to a power ring somehow or another. In any event, she decides a bunny's got to do what a bunny's got to do. And after a one-sided farewell, she goes rogue. It's back to the future for the plot as Silver meets with his thesis advisor to explain the significance of his findings. Mogul lets us know, Mammoth Mogul, lets us know that while Nagus was reestablishing himself on the throne, and Eggman was up to his unusual shtick, he himself preferred to sit back on his woolly haunches. But by the time the traitor had acted, it was too late. Yet despite the fact that the journal is fragmentedly at best, Silva believes it supports his theory that Antoine was the one who helped Nagus take the throne, and he wants to check it out. As a precaution, Mo Mogul keeps custody of the Time Stone and replaces it with a set of instructions on bailing out of the past before shooting Silva back in time. 
He arrives just as Commander Prower checks in on Tails. Tails. Amarius Prower hasn't really acted like it before, but he's still Tails' father. Turns out Tails has been burning the midnight whatever in the hangar, looking to set things right in his own in his own way and under his own power. But the commander gets a fear of promotion to dad as Tails breaks down completely. It seems everybody expects Antron to take the a, take a turn for the worse. If he was going to pull through, they wouldn't be talking as if he's already dead and gone. The council, meanwhile, meets with Nargis literally looming over them, pushing for a vote on exiling Nicole, who at least who at least is present for the hearing so that this doesn't become a star chamber. A star chamber, by the way, is a hearing where one's guilt or innocence, both usually guilt, but usually guilt, is determined in secret and the subject only finds out about it when they are arrested pending execution. So at least Nargis is making a show for playing, making a show of playing by the rules. Nicole affirms that the Nanites are pretty much self-sustaining and that she'd only be needed for new work. Nargis hints that he'd rather rely on old school construction techniques, which I'll bet includes slave labor. Nicole would be quarantine, off-site, and pretty much only be able to communicate by a remote hookup. The trump card, apparently, is that the citizenry are still freaked out about her. You'd think they'd update this stuff. We really got to worry about five. The vote in favor of quarantine Nicole is six to one, with Rotor the lone objector. Uncle Chuck tries to give Rotor a lesson in political expertise 101, but instead the big guy sings a chorus of take this job and shove it, and walks out, stating that the council has betrayed the Mobians, though Silver isn't present to hear him use the B word. While Uncle Chuck seems oddly satisfied that Rotor showed some moxie, Nicole chases after him to talk him out of quitting. She says, He's doing it because he couldn't help Antoine and Sally either. It turns out that Silver is present as something, as something of a stalker, taking all this in. This tells him that his boomer theory was a little off. You think? Meanwhile, Sonic has secluded himself in his room as his way of coping. Amy tries to get through to him, but he stays in his room. Amy then breaks down herself in the presence of Sonic's parents. And Sonic decides that maybe he should come up for some air. It's only then that he notices Silver skulking about. Silver tries to get a couple of words in edgewise. Unfortunately, the two words are Antoine and Traitor. The worst possible combination at this point. Sonic then drags Silver by the dreads into Antoine's hospital room. Well, there, Sonic discovers Bunny's farewell letter. When Silver, then tries, when Silver then tries to turn his theory on a dime and blame Bunny, Sonic really gets mad and tells him to hit the interdimensional highway. Then, just what we need, Jeffrey drops in to salute Antoine in a way that's so guarded and disconnected, it can't help but sound phony. Somebody needs to put him on an interavarous, interavarous, vitreism, interavarous vitreism. I don't know you. You have to read it when I put the link up. Okay. As Sonic bemoans the fact that the Freedom Fighters have come undone, who runs into Silver exactly? He then recruits the hapless. Runs into Silver. Exactly. Get it? Harvey who? He then recruits the hapless hitchhark for the Freedom Fighters tribute band, the Secret Freedom Fighters. All right, folks. Now, this is where the count comes in. Listen up. Head count's coming up. For the head school, this is what he says. Why do I get the sense 
that who and silver are cut from the same cloth. They each seem to have a measure of self-assurance that I really don't trust. If these two don't land themselves or each other in some seriously hot water, I'll be greatly surprised. Speaking of surprises, it doesn't seem like that big of a surprise that Silver turns up, up a small library full of stuff on the Freedom Fighters, but it's like he loses interest in all else when he discovers Antoine's journal. This tells me that whatever Silver's credentials as a as whatever Silver's credentials as a as a hero are, he'd never make a good historian. And it's not like he has a train to catch. Being in the future, he could take another year or two, man, uh, take another year or two analyzing the journal, and still land in the same bit of space and time he was aiming for anyway. Speaking of Antoine's journal, we realized that putting it in this story after its clumsy introduction in the last issue only makes things worse. One thing is for certain, as much as the journal device failed to pump up last month's story, it must be a total face pump for the audience to put up with yet another Silver dead end. Do we really need to sit and watch Silver make a yet of himself yet again? I was frankly shocked to learn the extent into which Antoine had Oh no, I was frankly shocked to learn the extent to which Archie had built on Silver's first appearance. In his first blunder, mistaking Sonic for the oblivious trigger in the ill-fated Sonic 2006 game. By the way, oblivious in a real word, it's a rabbit for devil. And you can find it in the Koran. More important for Archie's purpose, they treat the continuity as if Sonic 2006 never happened. This in part is consistent with the game itself since the future gets altered. I'm not worried about spoilers here. That game was spoiled when it hit the shelves. But by the kind of prevence, prevence reason, by the kind of perverse reasoning known to comic book writers and editors, Silver's cluelessness has become his personality trait. In much the same way the Cubot's morphing dialect chip defines him. He keeps popping in from the future, which somehow never takes a turn for the better despite his trips to past times uh, to get it wrong in the past. This time around, it's the labeling of Antoine as the traitor that's the goof du jour. The most obvious thing that can be said about Silver at this point is that he is in serious danger of getting in a rut. That's something that writer and editorial have to deal with at some point. The longer Silver acts like a one-trick pony, the less interesting he gets no matter how many lines he has or how many buildings land on top of him. More on how this can be turned around in the heart section. You'd think, as long as the council has been in existence, they put up more resistance to Nagus's hijacking the agenda. The council, I'm sorry to say, is the weakest link in the story. They appear, let themselves get bossed around by Nagus, and then adjourn. As it stands, they're so one-dimensional that they're teetering on the edge of a black hole. I suppose that helps make Roto look good by comparison, but it's not really that helpful. While the previous story's plot was simplicity itself, the escort to the acorns comes under attack and Antron gets blown up real good, this installment has way more moving parts. Small, one, small wonder that the five-page lead-off involving Silver, Immune, and Mogul spewing great gobs of exploitation onto the page gets broken up in the middle by the two-page scene in Antoine's hospital room where Bunny is given a monologue. And then we get a collection of characters grieving for Antoine and the business with the console and Nicole. 
and Rhoda's re resignation, and Sonic encountering Silver, and by that point the story is ready to spin into the wall. Maybe if we cared about some of the characters, it might have worked better. The Jeffrey scene was particularly bad in that Sonic passes up several opportunities to finally separate Jeff from some of his teeth. He needs to get this orange crate of his story back on the ground and into the shop for some much needed tightening, much needed tightening. Heart score, four. The eye score. Technically, Tracy Yardlin does great, good work. But this story does not let him play to one of his major strengths, page layout. On any other project, he could have done some major uh, artwork. Here, unfortunately, between the speech boxes, and there are a lot of them, and the sheer amount of story Ian tries to pack into one issue, many of the pages are overpacked act, and the feeling is one of claustrophobia. Even the sequences that would demand more attention, Tails breaking down, Amy breaking down, the whole business with Jeffrey and Antoine's hospital room, any of these moments would have been depicted by a splash page of a, con of a conventional magna. Disappear into the layout after having been shoehorned on into a panel here and a panel there, and then tucked into a page wherever there's an opening. If only editorial wasn't being led around by the devotion to the sacred number 250, the story at this point might have had a chance to breathe, and Tracy would have had a chance to let the illustrations carry the story off the page. I score six. Heart score. Here's, here we go, the heart story. For a story where Antoine isn't dead yet, everybody else sure acts as if he, he were already gone. Having seen enough of both in my life, there is a plot, pal, um, blah, there is a palatable difference between worry and grief. In the case of the former, there is a sense of frustration caused by the waiting for an unresolved situation mission to resolve itself. This is what Antoine is supposed to be now. But when the outcome is obvious, even before the fact, act, as in the case of the terminally ill, or when a death happens which nobody saw coming, the overwhelming emotional base is lost. That leads not to insecurity or anxiety, but grief. The kind on display in this story. Despite the fact that Antoine is unresponsive, Bunny's reciting an exploitation to him is not as goofy as it might seem. In fact, it's emotionally pitch perfect for one marriage partner to address the other in this manner. Because Bunny is in a complex emotional state for her own sorrow and sense of loss. Are lost, are tingered with guilt. It's pretty hard to miss Ian's signals from here. Bunny drops broad hints about how she feels responsible for being unable to help Antoine and her friends because she implies of her being unroboticized. Let me put it this way if she isn't going to go out to look for her uncle Buell to risk herself getting legionized slash re roboticized, in order to double class Unc and return to help her friends, Ian's wasting a perfectly good plot point. Tail's sequence, too, was achingly realistic as he tries and fails to lose himself in his work. He's young enough, though, that the mask falls and breaks quickly. And we finally get, and we finally, and he puts finally in italic, get to see an honest father son moment between Amidius and Mark. And, it's only took, and it only took practically killing one of the characters to do it. As for Amy Rose, she elects Sonic's parents as the recipients of her getting in touch with her own grief. Again, it's a good sequence in that it, since we know nothing about Amy Rose's family, well I don't anyway, 
Sonic's people are presumably safe enough for her to emotionally open up. They seem to be her surrogate family, providing a level of emotional support. In the flagship Archie comics, in the flagship Archie comic, the character of Kevin Kyler comes out of the closet to Jughead as they bond at the buffet. Likewise, in the famous story arc of For Better or For Worse comic strip, Michael Patterson's friend Lawrence comes out to him when he later tried talking to his parents about it. Oh, it, it was a day, comes out to him when he later tried talking to his parents, parents about it. It was a disaster. In fact, cartoonist Lynn Johnson was partially inspired by the fact that her brother-in-law trusted her enough when he came out himself. In a comic that trumps its credo of action and more action, this kind of emotional, well, this kind of emotionality is exceedingly rare. And then there's Sonic, unable to shake the memory of the time she's punked Ant, whether he deserved to be punked or not is besides the point. Sonic lets the music wash over him, if only to forestall the inevitable. Or to forestall the inevitable. It's interesting that he never wishes he could take anything back. Archie, however, wants to have its death and chest it, wants to have its death and chest it too. So Antoine's fate is left frustratingly up in the air. None of the cast members, however, appear ready to shift gears if his condition improves. Emotionally, gives, if his condition improves emotionally, they're simply too invested in mourning his loss. Props to Ian for one piece of psychological insight. When Bunny Tails and Amy are able to pour out their grief, it's always in the presence of another Mobian. Sonic isn't seen grieving, and Mutsky isn't much of a companion. So he's essentially stuck emotionally until Silva gives him something else to think about. The closest he comes um, is near the end of the story when he declares the old Freedom Fighter is finished due to the deterioration. Short lesson, everybody needs somebody. That's especially true for Silva. I said this once before that in this comic, he's a little bit, he's a little more than a pervor of weapons-grade cluelessness, and this issue is no exception. He essentially has the same problem that Sonic has always had since the beginning of this comic. He simply can't carry a story by himself because he just doesn't have enough personality. He either has to play off someone else or be teamed up with someone else. And if Archie expects Silver to be expects Ar, expects Silver to see more face time in this book, he'll have to be paired with someone other than the two old farts he left behind in the future that probably explain in the future. That probably explains his hooking up with Jana Ka in the Return of Urjak arc from Sonic Universe. The natural and obvious choice blaze. In other words, for someone for Silver to play off the, off of is blaze. I think we all know that. <laughs> for all the problems of this misbegotten game, of that misbegotten game, Sonic 2006, the interplay between Silver between Blaze and Silver was especially noteworthy. It was low key in the manner of tragic love stories ended with the two forced apart. This is pretty much the same way the Metarex saga ended in Sonic X, with Tails and Cosmo forcibly separated. Yet the story arc ends on a hopeful note as we see a pot with a young plant in it in Tails' workshop. One of the reasons that the pairing of Sonic and Sally works in this comic is that it worked in the Saturday Night TV series. Sonic was cool and reckless, Sally controlled and rational. It's not like they were obligatory paired. In other words, it's not like they were paired right off the bat. They were complemented. They, 
pair. They complemented each other. Like I said, it's not like they were, what he's saying is that it's not like they were paired right off the bat, like, oh, he's, here's his girlfriend, here's his, here's his boyfriend, back. No, they complemented each other's style and the, the character. The more I think of it, the more I think that a Silver and Blaze relationship has the same potential to go the distance. Seriously, Ian should get those two together. Heart score. I was really prepared to give this story a heart score of 10. Not only for its intensity, or not only for its intensity, but its reality. But I can go no higher than nine because Archie insisted on not letting Antoine die in the attack and thus adding honesty to the list. And that basically so far is his review of 235. I will provide a link down below for you guys to read the 235 review if you want to yourself. I will do his other review on Sonic Universe later tonight because I got a feeling my mom will be showing up real soon and uh, she's gonna want the living room to herself, you know what I'm saying? Well, not, not forget what I said. She's just gonna want the living room to herself so she can watch the shows and stuff. So, that's all I'm gonna say. Comment down below if you like. I'm going to recharge this battery for a little longer, and peace out.